Good evening, welcome. I'm Tony Clark from the Carter Presidential Library. I'm really glad you all uh, have joined us tonight. I think, uh, I hope everyone got a chance to see a towering task over the weekend. It is just a, a wonderful film about the Peace Corps and the reason we're here uh, here tonight to talk about it. We're very fortunate to have a, a wonderful panel to talk about it. Elena De Joseph is the director of the uh, the film. She's a returned Peace Corps volunteer. She has spent. 40 years, although looking at her, uh, I can't believe that she has spent 40 years in the, the film industry. Um, she is here. Ambassador um, Mary Ann Peters is joining us as well. Ambassador Peters is a former CEO of the Carter Center. She spent 30 years with the State Department. Um, she was part of the National Security Council staff, and she was ambassador to Bangladesh. Glenn Blumhorst is the head of the National Peace Corps Association, which is designed uh, to foster a lifelong commitment to the ideals of the, uh, the Peace Corps. He is also a return Peace Corps volunteer. Jason Carter, the grandson of President Carter, the great grandson of a return Peace Corps volunteer, his uh, great uh, grandmother, Miss Lillian. Um, he was a, uh, a volunteer in South Africa, wrote a book about it, Power Lines. He is the uh, head of the uh, uh, Board of Trustees of the Carter Center, a former state legislator uh, as well, and an attorney. And Marianne Kubilos is our most recent uh, Peace Corps, returned Peace Corps volunteer. She was in Panama from 2018 until the pandemic hit and she had to uh, come home. She, she worked in Panama in a little tiny village that had no electricity, no running water, and she worked with local artisan women, uh, really helping them get organized into a cooperative and uh, learning finances and that sort of thing to, to help make money. So uh, welcome to all of our panelists. And um, Elena, I wanted to start with you because I really hadn't thought about the Peace Corps in years. Um, and I remember remember it uh, quite well growing up. Uh, why did you want to make this movie? What, what was the reason behind the movie? Well, that was definitely part of it. Um, first of all, thank you for having us and thank you for putting on this fabulous event through the Carter Library. It's an honor to be here and I'm excited to get to talk to everybody and be on a panel with such distinguished panel members. Um, but yes, that was very much a reason, was that um, when we heard about the Peace Corps, which was very rare, um, back in the States, um, when we started this documentary, it usually was um, headlines. So it was when there was a murder or when there was uh, um, some natural disaster and volunteers had to be evacuated, there was no context. And um, I would be willing to bet that every return Peace Corps volunteer on this panel has had the question of, oh, is that still around about the Peace Corps at some point? And, and this vague notion of, oh, didn't that have something to do with John F. Kennedy? So one of the main reasons was that we were realizing that America was forgetting that there was such a thing as the Peace Corps. And just at a time when global problems like climate change were bearing down on, on our uh, global community, um, and it was so important to understand each other, uh, we, were, we were forgetting that America actually was doing something to understand the rest of the world. Uh, the other thing was that we had just come out of the production of two documentaries. One was about the US Forest Service, so another government agency, and the other was about conservationist Aldo Leopold, who very much talks about the, the land community and how connect, interconnected we all are. And, um, you know, seven years ago, it sounded like this shouldn't be too difficult to do a documentary about the Peace Corps. I would just find the official historian, I would find the official archives, and we'd put it together with pretty pictures and then add a few returned Peace Corps volunteers and former staff, and that would be it. Well, it turned out there was no uh, official historian for the Peace Corps, and there is no official archive. There are several different archives, all of them very important, but nobody had pulled together the official overall history of the Peace Corps. And the stack of books written about the Peace Corps is about this high. And, and I'm not talking about individual volunteer experiences, but I'm talking about scholars writing about the agency over time. So we were, in many ways, we were creating the history, which came with an enormous responsibility because we knew what whatever we would say would become de facto history. 
um, as the mythology in the Peace Corps community travels very quickly. And so we had to be very careful. Um, there were some beautiful stories that we followed down the rabbit hole and found out they weren't true. And then there were other stories that popped up that nobody had ever mentioned to us before that were stunning. Um, so it was quite an adventure and it was a wonderful story to be telling at a time when nationalist voices were rising and, and people were talking about walls. What a great time to be talking about our interconnectedness on a people to people level. And by the way, uh, 40 years is correct. I started at 10 years old as a film dubber. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Elena brings up an interesting point about because right now, uh, for the last four years, this country has, through its administration, looked inward, and the Peace Corps is really an effort to look outward. I'm curious, Ambassador Peters, when you were ambassador to, to Bangladesh, I think you had 70 Peace Corps volunteers there, and then they had to be evacuated, and they were brought back. What is it like from the State Department's view of, uh, from representing this country in another country. What's it like to have volunteers in the country? Well, thank you, Tony. First of all, um, the volunteers were evacuated after 9-11, but not in response to any kind of um, uh, demonstrations or, or um, uh, rising up against the presence of the volunteers. As you know, they're usually in rural areas they're almost always in rural areas, and that was true in Bangladesh as well, where they were frankly um, cherished members of the communities. So we were very sad to see them go. I understood the decision right after 9-11, as you can imagine. Uh, nobody really knew what would happen next. Uh, and uh, although one of the first things I did after I saw the uh, second plane crash into the Twin Towers on television on that evening, because for us it was evening, um, was to uh, call the uh, interior minister and ask for uh, special police protection for all Americans out, you know, in, in Bangladesh. And there were about 10,000. But I remember specifically mentioning the young Peace Corps volunteers. And, you know, we, we got great cooperation at the time. But I spent the next, you know, eight months, 10 months lobbying madly for the Peace Corps volunteers to come back. And they did come back in August of uh, 2002. They uh, left later, um, several years later, I understand due to concerns about uh, terrorism. But let, let me get back to your um, question. Um, I swore that class in, the class that came back in 2002. And I was so, so proud. You know, it was a time when all Americans had a bit of a, you know, a target on their, on their foreheads, um, because in any country, even a small country, but especially in a country the size of Bangladesh, which at the time had a population of about 130 million people, no matter how well intentioned the vast majority of the people, there could well be, and there were, uh, some bad actors, some extremists among the population. So there was always a sense of worry. But there was a great sense of pride. And I we can maybe talk later about the importance of people to people exchanges. Um, it is I, I don't I don't know how many anecdotes I have uh, about um, from people overseas who who learned to appreciate the United States through Americans, you know, not necessarily through our foreign policy. And I think, and maybe this is controversial, but I think the fact that the Peace Corps volunteers were usually young, Miss Lillian was an exception, made them kind of more cherished, less threatening, more vulnerable, less likely to be seen as agents of imperialism and much more likely to be seen as their younger daughter. So it, it, we were very, very proud of our PCVs, uh, Tony. Sorry for the long answer, but they were wonderful. No, and and Glenn, you represent the uh, the Peace Corps Association. Uh, what is it that ties all these these people together? Yes, well, again, good evening to everyone, and it is really such an honor to be a part of this panel of distinguished luminaries. And thank you to the Presidential Library and Museum for inviting us. Uh, I just can't start my comments without saying that. I do have apparently some internet uh, challenges here, so if I if I break up, let me know. 
Um, what connects us? Well, you know, it's that camaraderie and that uh, sense of shared experience um, that we have had as a part of our Peace Corps service that really connects us. And, you know, I think uh, you're, you're right. I think what you're referring to is that mafioso that we have uh, of uh, individuals who have served in the Peace Corps and returned and um, can relate directly to the experiences that we have in common and uh, share many of the same values and ideals uh, which we've gained from our Peace Corps experience um, abroad. Whether, you know, whether that's been two years, three years, or, or more or less, because there are different experiences that different individuals have. Um, I, my, myself, I served three and a half years in the Peace Corps. Um, you know, Mariana, our, our fellow here uh, with us, our, our fellow colleague, she is, you know, had her service interrupted. But each of those experiences are different and unique. And you know, I think more than anything, uh, we come back with a much greater appreciation for um, the uh, environments that we came from in the United States and were able to implement what we call the third goal of the Peace Corps because of that experience. And that, that, piece, that, ex that goal is really about bringing the world home and sharing our experiences uh, with those around us here in the United States so that there's a greater understanding of other countries and other cultures, other languages, and uh, toward building bridges of peace and friendship. But we, we, we will definitely recognize each other uh, in different environments when we see other RPCVs, Return Peace Corps volunteers, and we uh, will immediately begin to swap stories and we'll be, begin to share uh, uh, what has been for each of us a life transforming experience. Um, and I think 99% of the volunteers who come home will, will always say, um, you know, I got more of that out of that experience than I gave, and it was one of the most life transforming experiences that I've ever had. But you know, Glenn, that one of the interesting things is normally in a case where somebody's a volunteer and then they go on with the rest of their life, you tend to call them, oh, that was a former whatever volunteer, but you don't do that with the Peace Corps. It's, it's a return volunteer, and there's some reason for that, right? That's right. Well, uh, many would say once a Marine, always a Marine, and we say once a volunteer, always a volunteer. And, you know, as our mission is to champion lifelong commitment to Peace Corps ideals, you know, our return Peace Corps volunteers are simply returned volunteers. It's not former. We continue to serve in so many different ways and different capacities after our two years of Peace Corps service. As you know, many of them go on to become uh, teachers, uh, educators, uh, filmmakers, um, ambassadors, foreign service officers, business uh, entrepreneurs, and you know, and but we're always serving our communities. Uh, we have that sense of volunteerism and that spirit of, of community and uh, our service indeed lasts a lifetime. So we return back home, but we continue to serve our, our communities here and, and the world as well. Jason, I mentioned that your great grandmother uh, has become kind of a role model serving in the Peace Corps uh, uh, when she was uh, later in, in life. Why did, why did you want to join? Well, I, I think just mentioning my, we called her grandmama, people call it Nura is Miss Lillian. Um, but yeah, she turned 70 in the Peace Corps. And I think her experience infected my whole family um, with not just what Glenn and Mary Ann were saying and, and, and what the movie is about, but with this idea, not only that it's important for Americans to get out into these tiny places, but also that it's important for us all to recognize how much power there is in those little places, right? I mean, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter came from a town of 600 people in the middle of nowhere, uh, almost literally. You know, Grandmama was a little old lady from that same tiny town, and, and she she left and 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 went to India, um, all the way around the world, and 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 the connections that she made there, um, and the understanding that she brought back really confirmed what the Carter Center and all of these other organizations that really make change in the world uh, have known. And it's that you walk into a community and you're not gonna just find a place to send pity or a place to do work or a place to help people. You're gonna find a group of people who want to make their community the best that it can be. And when we begin the process of, of understanding just how much power there is in a single individual and the impact that they can make in a community, you bring that home. You look at your own community in different ways. You look at, at, at the way that the world really is put together. And especially in these days when we all feel 
so isolated from each other. Um, the idea that you can go across the world, not just connect with people, but become a part of that community and do good with those folks makes you realize you can do that anywhere. And, and I just think it's, you know, the, the Peace Corps volunteers, um, you know, I'll, I'll just say this. I mean, you know, the Carter Center has this, you know, gigantic budget and it's about to eradicate guinea worm disease, um, which is the, the, the second human disease ever eradicated. Um, and it will have done that in a lot of ways based on what Peace Corps volunteers started doing. <laughs> and that idea and the understanding that these single little tiny communities in the middle of nowhere, just like Plains, Georgia, are the ones that are going to make the change. And I have to say this, um, one of my best friends from the Peace Corps is a, is a guy named C.D. Glenn, who many of you probably know, um, but he's now on the Carter Center board with me. And, you know, we're, we're sitting here doing, you know, he's an incredible Africa experience. He's run all of these important things. He, he did a ton at the Peace Corps itself. Um, and now we get to work together 20 years after we got back from the Peace Corps um, doing that kind of work. And so it, it, to Glenn's point, it, it infects us all. And I, I am fascinated to hear uh, from Mariana about whether that's changed, but I, I don't think it has because I think that idea that that community changes the world is a fundamental truth. No, oh, Mariana, is this still the truth? <laughs> I definitely think it is, and I think it's it's a blessing that it is. Um, being evacuated, not it was so difficult, just being ripped out with such little notice, honestly. I, in Panama myself, I was one of the people that had most notice and I only had 12 hours to pack all of my belongings. And I was an 11 hour bus ride away <laughs> from Panama. So it really didn't give us much time. Um, and being back, the, the NPCA and other volunteers were just so willing to help and, and were so sympathetic with us um, and, and understanding in, in how rough it is to be transitioned so quickly back that I remember our Facebook groups and WhatsApp messages being bombarded with help for resume help or for connections for jobs. And, and so definitely that solidarity still exists today. And, and I, I wouldn't have my, my current job and many of my colleagues wouldn't have, wouldn't be where they are without connections through the Peace Corps, either through preparation or because they met someone that, that helped them along the way. So, so definitely lucky to stick, to be a part of such a, a lovely and, and helpful community. You know, I hadn't thought about it until you were just talking because you came back, you know, one day you're in a small village with no electricity, no water, and then just a short time later, you're back in the United States. And I would think that kind of change has got to be difficult. Definitely. Um, there's, there's almost guilt associated with it as well like just leaving especially around a pandemic knowing that my community members are so low income we don't, they didn't even have electricity or, or they still don't have electricity or water and don't have even access to medical um, or professional health care during a pandemic being ripped out from that and put back into the u.s where we do have all of these opportunities and resources available to us was very guilty for a lot of us and and struggling with that of kind of coming back and and understanding, okay, well, what is my role now as an evacuated returned Peace Corps volunteer? How do I come to terms with the fact that now I have all of this privilege and all of these opportunities? Well, I know that my counterparts and my friends in Panama, South Africa, wherever we were, um, are, are struggling, struggling even more than we are. Um, but, but yeah, it was definitely. I, I make fun of myself because one of the most uh, one of the most difficult things coming back was going to a grocery store. I was so used to going to a little food mart that had like five options for food, and I would just choose whatever they had. And now I walk into a Kroger here in Atlanta, and I'm almost overwhelmed with all of the options, and I don't even know what to choose. <laughs> so, so it was little things like that that made things a, a little harder. And I can, can I say one quick thing about that, Tony? Yeah, please. Like one, one of so I came back, Mariana, just like that. I mean, to 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 Steve Som's point on the on the chat, like 
I, we we got to prepare to come back and all this stuff. It must have been like a real shock to have to just drop everything and go back. But one of the things that happened is I got back and I had been back less than a year when I got engaged to my my college girlfriend. Um, and we went and I had moved sort of straight to New York City from rural Africa, which is its own culture shock. But we ended up going to register, like to do a registry for our wedding. And we walk into this like crate and barrel and start and they give you this like gun to go and zap these you know how many highball glasses and you're inviting all these people and you want to make sure that you've ordered enough so that your friends who only want to spend ten dollars can spend ten dollars and we just started zapping all of this stuff in the crate and barrel and halfway through i just started bawling crying i just was standing in this crate and barrel and she was like oh my god you're so broken like what happened to you in the peace Corps, right but at the same time like it was such a fundamental part of coming back and being like i don't need whatever, eight highball glasses and eight pill. I mean, I, it was so foreign to me, like just thinking of going into the grocery store for you. It was, it was one of those experiences for us. And like, we talk about it all the time in my family, but there's no doubt that that is a big piece of it. And everybody, when you were talking about the grocery store that I can see on my screen was nodding like this, like exactly that just happened. So to, to answer the, the question, I said, no, it has not changed very much. <laughs> But you know, Jason, I was just thinking, it was great training for you for the work that you do now at the, the Carter Center in understanding what it's like in small villages and leadership and the needs. Wasn't that right? I mean, frankly, not just the Carter Center, but the Georgia Senate and the, the community that I live in and the folks that want to be on the school board in Atlanta and they're wondering how to, to, to talk to people. And, and the answer is you, you go and you talk to people. You go and you sit with them and you try to understand as best you can and you believe there's going to be connections. I mean, I for me, it's the best training ever. You asked why I decided to go. I mean, you know, my grandfather had been president of the United States and I had a bunch of options for what I wanted to do. And and I started asking all of the people that I thought had interesting jobs sort of in the development world. And, you know, whether they worked at IFAS or NDI or all of these sort of neat organizations, I, it wasn't that they suggested that I should go be in the Peace Corps. It said all of them had been in the Peace Corps. <laughs> it was like, it was like, well, I was in the Peace Corps and then I did blah. And I was in the Peace Corps and I did blah. And so, you know, that, that level of training is real. And even now, you know, I, if I bump in, you know, to Christopher Dodd or, or somebody who's been in the Peace Corps and gone on into politics, the connection about the Peace Corps is way more important than any connection about politics or, or anything else, because it's just a way you see, look at the world. But I think it's great training for everything. Yeah. Glenn, are these common stories? Yeah, they're very common stories. And, you know, I just want to reflect on the fact that what we're speaking about here is community. This is tremendous sense of community and uh, you know, I think we start that uh, sense of community when we serve in the Peace Corps because you know, we uh, we go to serve and to be open and listeners uh, to our communities and in some way you know, become a part of the community and then uh, you know be facilitators uh, of any um, any things that we can that are good and and so uh, be, by becoming part of a community and and taking that role we bring that role back with us and. Uh, the 240,000 plus individuals who have served in the Peace Corps as volunteers, plus the, the former staff and um, others who care deeply about the Peace Corps are part of that community because we share that common experience and that common commitment to being connected and serving others. And you know, so I think that sense of community really is what binds us together as well and creates that, that sense of camaraderie. Uh, these are all very typical stories, and uh, you know, they're each unique in themselves, but they're all very similar and along the, the same thread. Ambassador Peters, when when Peace Corps volunteers first come into to country, what kind of assistance, warnings, help that uh, is there that that you and the embassy can give them, uh, and then when they they leave, this that sort of thing. Well, of course, the Peace Corps does handle that. And I was, uh, I not only worked with uh, Peace Corps volunteers in Bangladesh, but in Bulgaria, where I was the deputy chief of mission uh, in 1991, just after the, well, you know, um, just not long after the wall came down, shortly after the Warsaw Pact had been disbanded. And I know it was controversial within the Peace Corps, uh, among, especially among volunteers who'd served in harder hardship places, much harder than Bulgaria, to tell you the truth. Um, 
Uh, but it was a great thing for us. And what the embassy did, of course, we were uh, the, the Peace Corps country director, whose name was Azadine Downs. I don't know if any of you know Azadine, but um, uh, he, he was a member of the embassy country team. So he was part of the senior leadership uh, so that he would know what we knew and we would know what he knew. Now, what I want to be clear about is Peace Corps volunteers are not so many political officers scattered around the country reporting back to Washington. I was very glad, Alana, that you included in the film that letter from Dean Rusk in 1963 or whatever it was, uh, because they're extraordinarily valuable, but it's not deliberate in any way. Now in Bangladesh or in Bulgaria, whenever anybody from the embassy traveled to a town or village where Peace Corps volunteers were working, they of course asked if the Peace Corps volunteer would like to get together, but it was more so they could bring them cookies or toothpaste than so they could, you know, pick their brains. But certainly, uh, you know, had there been anything serious going on, I think, you know, the Peace Corps volunteer would have, you know, Peace Corps volunteer might have said um, something, uh, but this is not a, a any kind of, um, you know, rural cadre of intelligence officers. I want to be clear about that. And we all knew that and respected it. But we also wanted to invite Peace Corps volunteers for Thanksgiving dinner. It's a tradition in the Foreign Service that you try to find Americans who might not have access to a turkey. And, and if they can make it into the capital or to the consulate, you know, we'd invite them in. But we really felt they were you know, a precious asset. Uh, and of course, our officers would brief. When they came into country, the Peace Corps director would design a, a, an orientation program and um, would take advantage of the expertise of some members of the embassy staff to brief the volunteers on whatever it might be. And security, the, what we call the RSO, the regional security officer, would always be one of the people, at least in my experience, to brief the volunteers. So it was a you know a, a, it was a great relationship. And by the time you know I, I served with my first PCVs, which was in 91, the Foreign Service was very much used to the Peace Corps. You know, it may have taken a few years in some places. And I, you were very diplomatic, Alana, but I know what you must have faced from the typical Foreign Service officers of the early 60s, what the Peace Corps must have faced back in the day <laughs> before, uh, before um, the Foreign Service officers kind of understood what kind of uh what this program was really all about because alana that's one of the things as ambassador peter said you bring up in the film is what is the role are they extensions of the the government that are designed to uh, uh push policy uh rather than help people not at all and that was a very deliberate way that the agency was set up in the beginning because shriver um, and, and Harris Wofford and those founders, they knew that if Peace Corps volunteers were in any way perceived to be part of the State Department or to be spies, that would spell the end of the Peace Corps before it even started. Uh, because the most important currency for Peace Corps volunteers is trust. If you think of your own neighborhood and you think somebody from another country moves into your neighborhood and then rings your doorbell and says, so, Let's talk about some things we can do to improve your community. How likely are you to talk to them the first time they come around? How likely are you to talk to them after they've been there for a week? And so for Peace Corps volunteers, many times people talk about the first year being all about building trust, about being a good listener and paying attention to, in the 60s, they called it the felt needs of the community is trying to figure out what, what the community wants so you don't swoop in as this imperialist, this neo-colonialist agent, but that you become part of the community before you try to um, share any of your knowledge. And when we produced the documentary, we had this one um, saying that, that we found kind of epitomized Peace Corps and it came from a woman who had nothing to do with Peace Corps. She was a, an Australian Aboriginal activist. Her name was Lilla Watson and she said, if you've come to help, you're wasting your time. If you've come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. And it's this whole notion of we're all in the same boat. And the reason we're helping each other is, is not for this, you know, top down kind of uh, neo-colonialist uh, thinking. It is about 
mutual survival and, and, and mutual thriving. And um, when we first produced the documentary, we were racking our brains of how do we get Lilla Watson's quote into this documentary? But there was just no way that it fit through the Peace Corps filter because she had nothing to do with the Peace Corps. And it really wasn't until the last year of production that I sat back and really focused on John F. Kennedy's words in his inaugural address, the, the ask not speech that everybody knows, the first part of the quote of everybody knows the ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. All Americans have that memorized. But very few continue listening when he says, citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. And it dawned on me, he said the same words that Lilla Watson said, just in different words. And so I was, I, I knew we had to keep the, keep the entire clip in the documentary and then that set the tone for the, for the whole documentary. But you know, one of the things that I did not realize till I saw the film was how different administrations viewed the Peace Corps. Um, there was an administration that just really didn't care for it, thought it should be phased out, should be moved into another agency. And it's the the politics behind it uh, and the survival of the Peace Corps that I found just, just really fascinating. And it was always a balance. At the end of the day, the Peace Corps is a government agency. And so while it is independent within the executive branch, it is still a government agency. So volunteers are not out there as, as ambassadors of democracy. Volunteers are out there as, as people, as Americans. Uh, but as an agency, the agency still is headquartered in Washington, DC, and it still has political appointees. In fact, it has a higher percentage of political appointee than many other agencies do. And so there were times in the Peace Corps history where it swung dangerously close to becoming a tool of foreign policy. And then you have this incredible return Peace Corps volunteer community. And I never envy Glenn his position at the head of the National Peace Corps Association because there are 240,000 of us who all think we know better how to run the Peace Corps and who all are not shy about telling National Peace Corps Association leadership, Peace Corps leadership about what should be done differently. And so the upside of that is that there were plenty of return Peace Corps volunteers who pushed hard whenever Peace Corps was in danger of going down that path of becoming a political tool. Glenn, how is that balancing act, a federal agency that uh, really is, is at its best when it feels independent? Well, yes, uh, as Alana said, you know, it, its independence is, is very important in terms of keeping its distance from U.S. foreign policy while representing the best of America. And our number one goal at National Peace Corps Association, as defined by our community of returned Peace Corps volunteers, is that we want the Peace Corps to be the best that it can be. And, you know, in many ways that has to do with just ensuring that it has its federal funding uh, each year. That's not always uh, something that can be counted on. Of course, in the last five or six years, we've seen the Peace Corps funding uh, flat, uh, no increases at all. And we've seen threats against its funding uh, from time to time, uh, even as recent as last year. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it is something that while we, we focus on the funding of the Peace Corps, we also look at how uh, the experience for volunteers and the nature of the Peace Corps and its independence uh, needs to be ensured as well. Uh, so we often, um, are uh, cognizant and looking at ways where the Peace Corps independence could be threatened. There was, for example, a bill introduced in the Senate, uh, I believe in 2019, by Senator Scott that would have realigned the Peace Corps under, I believe, the State Department. And of course, you know, that is not something that would be dangerous for the Peace Corps and for the volunteers themselves, would jeopardize their independence and their safety. So, um, you know, that is not something that we would, we would uh, want to see happen and we would push back strongly against that. There's, there's other ways that we work to help make Peace Corps best as well. It's be the best it can be as well. And a lot of that is related to the safety and security of volunteers, ensuring that the Peace Corps is, is uh, doing their best as they do uh, emphasize the safety and security of volunteers is their utmost priority. Uh, but from time to time, uh, there has been a need for legislation to ensure uh, that that is, you know, that is indeed the practice uh, with, with the volunteers and return volunteers. So, you know, I think in terms of its independence, though, um, we will always um, believe that it has to be as independent as possible. Um, though in many ways, you know, 
there is a direct connection with the government. Yeah. Mariana, um, question for you. What is it like on your first day there or first week there? What is it that the people you, you go into a village, what is it that the people there want to hear? They want to ask you, uh, what can you tell me? What is, what is it like? during that, that first week or so? Honestly, it's, it's, it's beautiful. Um, the knowledge that we take for granted here in the US and the education, level of education we take for granted here is crazy. I got some of the most crazy and, and innocent questions asked, like um, how does the solar system work? Or do planes crash into clouds when you're flying? And so just trying to explain things that we consider so basic um, here in the US to, to others was really eye-opening. Um, and it kind of showed me that I needed to, if I wanted to get any work done, whether it was a tangible project or even just basic education, which I ended up doing with uh, finance and leadership skills, I had to meet the people, like my community members where they were. And, and, get, and kind of gauging that and understanding what their level of education was, their life experiences up to that point, um, it, it really helps in, in, in understanding how you can measure and how you can make impact in your community as well. So it was, it was a lot of confusion for them, I think, on my first day, because I was a second volunteer, so they had just had their first volunteer leave abruptly, and a couple days later, she, and she was blonde and tall and I'm curly haired and slightly shorter. So they were just very confused. Um, and then also it was a lot of curiosity as to what our lives were, what we wanted to do and, and just kind of that basic human connection that we, that we forget with politics and everything else. It was just, that was it. And it was just trying to communicate in, in my broken nobere, which is their indigenous language and their broken Spanish, we were trying to communicate. And, and it was just in, in a memory I can't forget and, and just one of the most beautiful human experiences I think I've ever had. Jason, kind of the same question for you about when you first got there. And I'm curious whether in the, the uh, community you were in, whether people knew this is a grandson of a president of the United States and kind of what their reaction was to, uh, to you. Yeah, no, they didn't know. And I didn't tell anybody. I mean, you know, you uh, people didn't know until kind of late in the game. And I, the, the thing to, to Mariana's point, just the same way, when I got there, people had so many questions about America, just so many. And, and South Africa's moment um, was so good for me because it was right, you know, Mandela was still the president. Uh, the the post-apartheid struggle was beginning and the, the wounds of apartheid were still just wide open and people were confronting them in their own ways. And it was sort of, you know, I had missed in some ways um, the immediate aftermath of the civil rights movement in, in the United States, but we were still living it, of course, and we're still living it today in the United States. But for, for me in South Africa, you know, the littlest kids had never seen really been this close to a white person before. So the preschoolers would come up and, you know, touch my my arm just to see what it felt like and whether it was the same, you know, to, to the, the words that she used is just a human connection. Um, and, and, you know, building on that. But then the questions I used to get about America were, for example, you know, in South Africa, they have 11 official languages. And so I spoke Saswati and Zulu where we lived, but um, they, one question I remember was, you know, Jason, in America, is it true that black people and white people speak the same language? And I said, you know, yes. And they said, wow, it must be so easy to communicate, <laughs> right? And, and, you know, we all Americans chuckle at that because, you know, we have, have laid on top of all of these discussions about race, such a poor dialogue over so many years. But, you know, those were the kinds of questions about my country and about how we lived that were eye-opening for them because I was talking about it, but really were a reflection for me 
um, of who I was and, and where my community was. And, you know, the similarities between Georgia and South Africa um, are immense, except that, frankly, South Africa probably has done more truth telling uh, and more, you know, analysis and understanding of, of many of those sort of racial racist histories that, than we have uh, in a lot of ways. And so it was it was a remarkable experience to be the first white person in a hundred homes uh, or a thousand probably um, to be, you know, at there at that moment that was so meaningful to me. But again, it comes back to, to Mariana's point and to what we've all been talking about, what Glenn was talking about community. You, you build these connections in these places where you can't possibly expect to build them. And it makes you realize that those connections are possible everywhere. You know, I was just thinking when you were talking about him touching your your arm, and I'll, I was just watching a, a documentary of Pete Sousa and uh, the filming uh, or his photographs of President Obama, and he spends a bit of time uh, talking about this little boy who comes in and, and President Obama bends over and touches his hair, uh, and it is that connection. Oh, you're like me. Uh, that is the sort of thing that I think uh, you all are talking about, the role of uh, of the Peace Corps and the Peace Corps volunteers. Ambassador Peters, is that is that a good assessment? I think Jason and Mariana have just described, um, you know, why the Peace Corps strikes people who are uh, doing good work, uh, but but work nevertheless in an embassy building in a capital city, why the Peace Corps strikes us as so precious, really, as so precious. I mean, I loved those few days when I could leave the embassy and I would go with my driver and my bodyguard and a political officer and an interpreter to see uh, an aid project, maybe to see a, a Grameen Bank microfinance project. And once in a while, just because I was a woman, actually, I was able to break out with just the interpreter and maybe talk to a few women, but not most of the time. And most of the time it was a photo op. I mean, it wasn't really me interacting with the people. It was somebody getting pictures to splash all over the newspaper, see how caring the United States is, the ambassador goes to the... But it was actually, of course, the, the best day I'd had all month would be leaving the embassy and getting out there in those few moments of human contact that I was able to have. And sometime, um, you know, if you want to know, I'll tell you about the professor from Auburn University who was running a project to, um, to teach people in a village uh, which kinds of freshwater fish could thrive in poorly aerated village ponds because they're, you know, and so that was great. And, and what the women said to me when I was able once in a while, you know, to talk with them one on one. But I can, uh, I, I just think it's so precious to have young Americans having these experiences, these legitimate experiences with the people of countries while we're kind of stuck in the capital dealing with the elites. As I said, it's a marvelous job. As Glenn said, many our, our PCVs have become foreign service officers, but it's a different job. And, and um, I, one more thing, you know, I, I met with all the interns at the Carter Center, usually in groups of six to eight, um, and we had about 140 a year. And I always advised them, if they were interested in a career in the diplomatic service, to do something else first. And I would list a couple of options, but the first one was always the Peace Corps. I, Tony, if I might, I think my grandfather, is truly jealous of my time in the Peace Corps for the reasons that Marianne described. Like he he hasn't, he has done more than certainly any other president. Uh, he has spent more time in tiny villages in Africa, for example, than any other president probably ever. Um, he has done, and, and you know, I'm not, that's not bragging. That's just, I think it's that's just, true. That. yeah, that's true. But he has done it the way that Marianne just described, right? He he can't really even walk into a McDonald's in Cordial, Georgia, without you know an entourage. Um, but that time that I got to go and have those real human connections, I think that's the the thing about that I have been able to do that he most wishes he'd been able to do. And this is somebody who's been to 160 countries or something. I think literally 150 something countries in his life, and they're about to celebrate their 75th anniversary as a couple this this summer. Um, 
but and you know enormous success and enormous sets of experiences but that experience that i got to have that he didn't i think is the one that that he wishes uh the most he could have had you know and i i keep thinking of something your grandmother mrs carter used to say that she would come back uh, they'd come back from a trip to africa and she would just be exhausted because it it is really physically difficult and they weren't youngsters at the time but and she'd say that's the last time i'm gonna do this i can't do this anymore until she finds out about a need that some community has or some way that they can impact on people and then president and mrs carter are back on a plane headed back uh, again well and they'd also do 14 countries in like 14 days. I mean, it's not like they travel like normal people, like they're ridiculous, but anyway, they, they, it is, it's a meaningful thing for them, for sure. Yeah. Um, one thing, uh, and now it is, uh, Elena, one of the things that I'm curious about is, as I said, I grew up knowing about the Peace Corps. Why is it I don't hear much about it anymore. I mean, I used to see commercials about um, the hardest job you'll ever love and, and all of that, but I don't see that anymore. Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is that they, the Peace Corps does not have the same marketing budget that it had um, adjusted for inflation, of course, in the beginnings. Um, also, the people who did the marketing and came up with the strategies were brilliant in those early years. They uh, Shriver was really, really smart to hire uh, journalists, and and he 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 preempted negative press by bringing the best journalists onto the staff of the Peace Corps, and um, and then they were able at the time to get these incredible public service announcements. Now regulations have changed. The fairness doctrine in the 80s um, that was that was removed in the 80s actually was part of part to blame because suddenly there weren't. Uh, public service announcements didn't appear as much on television anymore because there was no pressure to put them on there. Um, that was a big hit. The other problem also is the media landscape has changed a lot. So now getting through to your average, average viewer is much harder when there are so many different ways that people are being bombarded with information, whether this is through hundreds of TV channels or social media channels or um, or blogs or information. It's so hard to rise above the din with any kind of information. So even if they had the same budget, and um, I'm sure they have wonderful people working there, um, and, but even if they hired the stars of the journalism field, it probably would be really, really difficult to get that same kind of, kind of attention. And then lastly, the Peace Corps image in the American public is, um, as, as Peace Corps historian John Coyne describes it, it's mom's apple pie. It's harmless. And, you know, I, I think of the Hitchhiker's Guide of the, for the Galaxy. I don't know how many of you read that, but it's uh, in it. There's a book that uh, is a hitchhiker's guide to the entire galaxy for space travelers. And it's because there's so many planets, there isn't a lot of space. And so for Earth, there's only a two word entry and it says Earth is mostly harmless. And I think in best case scenario, Peace Corps' mom's apple pie, worst case scenario, Peace Corps is mostly harmless. And so it's a very narrow range where we don't really get too worried about it. It's not often a very scandalous topic. It doesn't rise into the headlines very much unless there is a, a murder or some disaster. And, um, and then it stays in the news for a very, a very short time. And we don't have those great PSAs that everybody can recite of the toughest job you'll ever love or the glass, glass half full or all of those. It's just a lot more challenging and it needs to be part of the conversation again because I also think that Peace Corps is connected to so many different things that are essential right now in a global community. Um, you know, when you go to, onto a university campus, people that can talk about the Peace Corps range from the uh, business school about talking about economic development to the public health school who can talk about global health and pandemics and public health to uh, the engineering department who can talk about appropriate technology and sustainable sustainable engineering to the environmental sciences who can talk about climate change. There are just so many different places that the Peace Corps is involved that it almost gets overlooked. It doesn't get seen as the serious player in all of these topics when really it should be because we need to remember the importance that it all starts with that people to people connection. Glenn, is, is recruitment of Peace Corps volunteers more difficult these days? 
Well, um, I can't speak directly to that because I'm not involved in Peace Corps recruitment, but what I would add to what Alana was saying and, and in response to your earlier question is that most uh, Peace Corps volunteers decided to join the Peace Corps because they met a returned Peace Corps volunteer. So returned Peace Corps volunteers, whether were teachers or ambassadors or um, playwrights or you know uh, entrepreneurs, whatever we are, wherever we're serving, uh, quite often are the, are the first time that somebody has met or heard about the Peace Corps is from us. And you know, so our, our role of getting back home here and then speaking in the schools and, and in public events and the Rotary Clubs and, and, and those types of opportunities really is how many people for the first time hear about uh, or learn about the Peace Corps as an opportunity. Um, so you know, those types of programs are very important. There's, you know, I, I really truly believe that Peace Corps attracts individuals who are idealistic and, and want to serve others. And, you know, that is the best of America. And that's what I think we represent as a country. So, you know, there, there will from time to time be an ebb and flow of application numbers. But the bottom line is before the pandemic, um, there were something like, you know, 16 or 17,000 applicants each year for what were you know, roughly 3,500 slots available. And so there's a tremendous demand for serving in the Peace Corps. There's uh, plenty of opportunity. There's in many countries that would like to have more volunteers or expanded programs and other countries that would like to have new, new programs. Uh, that Peace Corps could easily probably double its, you know, its size if the funding was there. But the restriction, the limitation over the years has always been funding. It, it's just not been a funding priority for the Congress or the administrations. And we're, we're very, very hopeful that that's going to change soon uh, because we do want that every young American or old American or veteran American or whatever they are that wants to serve has the opportunity to serve. Glenn, I, I also have heard that from some return Peace Corps volunteers that there is a debate underway among organizations about what their roles should be in the future, how active or activist in, in bringing about change. Is that right? If you're referring to the role of Peace Corps volunteers in their service and bringing about change, I think, you know, we, we, we are change agents, but we're more than anything, we're facilitators. And that comes back to the importance of listening in our community and, and seeing how we can inspire or spark or, or facilitate the positive change in the communities that we serve in. And you know that again brings back comes back home with us and and how we can be positive change agents here in the United States and you know the top issues for our community when we return are climate change and racial justice and refugee issues and the things that that right now we see as crisis situations and where we can bring about change so you know being involved in that way after our Peace Corps service is so important to us and you know we we do want to make the world a better place. So so bringing those skills and that empathy and the the know how that we have brought back as a community member to our communities here at home I really hopefully will bring about that change. Mariana, I think there may be folks out there that would think, you know, I'd be interested in the Peace Corps, but I really don't know that I've got the kind of training that I that I'm qualified to do that. How do you know, you know, uh, Miss Lillian was a nurse, okay? I understand that. But um, how do you know that what you have to offer is really what would help people around the world? I mean, I think that the fact that I'm qualified enough to be on this panel shows that anyone's really qualified to be in Peace Corps. Um, the beauty of it is that you can, you can, go into the community and as long as you're open-minded and, and putting the community first and that's really what's driving you in your daily interactions, that you're gonna find the project that works best for you. And you're gonna find the, the way to make the most impact that is best for you. Like I said before, whether that's making a huge project, my partner who was also in the Peace Corps with me in Panama, but in a separate community, he made an aqueduct um, with his community. That's incredible. Um, but other people simply, or not, I shouldn't say simply, but they taught about sexual health and sexual and, and, and just spreading that information to people who don't have that kind of uh, those, that access to resources is really important too. So when you weigh it, what's more important, aqueduct or the knowledge of how, of sexual health, 
it's kind of hard to to make an equivalent of those two, you know. So people find the projects that they're meant to work for, work with, and and people find their niche there as long as their main purpose is to help the community. Because um, if if you're listening, if you're being active, if you're noticing what your community members are are needing and what they're asking for then at the end of the day, you're a resource, even if it's just access to the internet to help them get those resources, you're someone that's there to help them in any way that they need. And so I encourage everyone to go to the Peace Corps as well, no matter what their age is, no matter what their professional background is, because I'm a strong believer that anyone can make a difference, even if it's just in one person's life, which is more than enough. Um, and that's really what the Peace Corps is all about. Well, Jason, how do you make sure that you don't come off as a know-it-all? Here I am, somebody from the United States who has come into an African community, and I'm going to tell them, here's how you do whatever. I, I, I chuckled a tiny bit because I'm not 100% sure that like my law partners, for example, don't think I achieve not coming off as a know-it-all. But anyway, um, we, uh, I, I think to, when you, when you show up, um, Peace Corps has an incredible training program. They probably taught more languages to more people than any other organization. They've taught so many people how to deal with the cultural, um, you know, barriers that exist when you first arrive. They, you know, you spend three months in general getting your technical training so that you know at least what the what what, what the technical aspects of your job are going to be. Um, and then, and so you've you've got that knowledge plus you're from the United States. And then they drop you off, and you're standing there by yourself, and you realize you don't know anything. You don't know anything about your community. You don't know who's what. You don't know where you're supposed to go. You don't know anything about how you're going to live your life. And and I think the the biggest fear, at least for me, was not that I was going to be a know-it-all. It was that I was going to be completely worthless. Um, and so I, I think that that the humility that comes from relying on the people in your community to 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 help you. Uh, really live your life and, and know what you need to do to, 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 to live in the systems that, of course, they've had since they were born, right? I mean, this is, these are folks who laugh and love and the children play and they do all of these things in these communities and you get there and you think, how am I going to do this? Um, so you, it, the, the back and forth learning, the, the humility that comes from learning the language, from being guided around, you know, all of that, I think, is, is the key. And, and so I guess really the answer is, you just have to be open, um, the way that Mariana just said it, to to seeing and, and understanding and, and having your first goal be uh, to be trusted um, and, and to, to understand that community. It's it's a it, that's how it starts, and that's the only real way that it can start. I think. Yeah, Elena, because we're starting to to get close to the end. I'm curious what you want the film to accomplish. Well, the most basic first step of what we'd want out of this film is that America remembers that there is a Peace Corps. It would be so important for us to have this film reach beyond the return Peace Corps volunteer community. And that's why a screening with a Carter Museum and Library is so rewarding because we are not just talking to each other. The Peace Corps community is in a silo and, and we're very good at talking to each other about our various stories. Uh, but it's hard to reach beyond the community. And, and um, while we are congratulating each other about how great the Peace Corps is, in the meantime, America is forgetting that there is a Peace Corps. So step one is America needs, the, the documentary, we want the documentary to reach the American public. And we're working with PBS right now, uh, uh, getting it on, on to um, uh, broadcast television, hopefully within this year, and then reach instead of thousands of viewers, millions of viewers. Um, that's very important. We also want to inspire people to talk more about why we engage with the rest of the world. So when we were in the middle of production and we were found ourselves in Liberia in January of 2017, I had this list of very complex inside questions, you know, about the independence of the Peace Corps from the Foreign Service and all that. I, we were about to interview the U.S. ambassador, ambassador to Liberia. And so I, I thought, oh, I have all these really cool questions. And then I was watching the inauguration and I realized that for many Americans, even knowing why we engage with the rest of the world is a tentative proposition. 
And so I realized I needed to go much more basic with those questions. Why do we have embassies in other countries? Why is a people-to-people -people connection with other countries really important? And so I'm hoping that this documentary can spark that conversation a little bit more of what does global citizenship mean? And, and what, what do the global problems, how do we answer the global problems that are facing the global community right now? And why is it important for us to step out of America as Americans to be able to look back at America and the rest of the world in a more humble way? And um, maybe get beyond American exceptionalism to the point, like Jason was saying, I think one of the biggest lessons that Peace Corps teaches you is humility. And, um, and being able to have that conversation around America as a member of the world community uh, is incredibly important. And I think the Peace Corps provides such a beautiful lens for so many topics to be discussed around, um, as we said, on campus communities, you know, where we can bring everybody in and we can talk about all these topics through the lens of the story of the Peace Corps. Yeah, as we as we wrap up, I was going to see if anyone has any final comments. I, uh, Ambassador Peters, I was just thinking what Alana was saying, the Peace Corps plays a very vital role in showing that the United States is interested in more than itself, doesn't it? Yes, Tony. And if I can just um, say one final thing, I loved uh, how many times during this um, during this event, I've heard the word listen or listening. And I, you know, that's what Peace Corps volunteers do. That's what they have to do. But I think that's what the United States has to do. And it's terrific that we have a quarter of a million people, at least, who already know how to do it as we try to move forward in this country. So that's what, I, that's what I'd like to end with. Mariana, final comment? Um, yeah, I mean, thank you guys for having me on this panel. And I think that the Peace Corps has done some great job in the past and it has a lot of work to continue doing. Um, and it's important that for me, at least the evacuation shed light that Peace Corps, although it's a, such an incredible organization, also has room to grow, especially in places where it comes down to, to racial conversations and stuff within the Peace Corps. And that's something that our evacuation and specifically my time in Panama also shed light on. So acknowledging that those are conversations that we are having at home, having in communities and also need to have within Peace Corps and reflect upon, I think is, is important. And some food for thought that I'll, I'll leave the, the panelists and everyone listening. Yeah. And Glenn, final thought? Well, also just to thank you for the opportunity to be on this panel with uh, my colleagues and just to say, you know, that uh, Peace Corps, in my opinion, from a federal funding pr perspective, represents the best bang for the buck we can get in our federal budget. Uh, now's the opportunity for us to expand the Peace Corps. We're working with members of Congress to, toward that end, and we believe that uh, while we can uh, see the Peace Corps become the best that it can be through both expansion of the programs, but also improvements and reforms that need to be made at the, at the Peace Corps, much like Marianne alluded to there. And we're going to get that accomplished now, and we're looking forward to working together as a community to make it happen. So thank you again for letting me be a part of this panel. Thank you. And finally, um, Jason, was you provided kind of a final thought for the film as well. Uh, and I thought you might want to uh, wrap us up with that. Your microphone. Like you're on mute is the theme of 2020 and now 2021. Um, uh, and really what that means is we're not um, on mute and we have this great voice and Alana and the folks that are talking about it um, and, and the, the folks on this panel have been wonderful. So um, as we discussed earlier, the, 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 the idea of community, it's really an idea of humanity and how we define ourselves and this Peace Corps ideal. And I was honored that, uh, that in this film, does sort of conclude with this comment about Ubuntu, which is this Kosa and Zulu or Nguni language phrase that defines humanity as a, as a you know, it's Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Nabanya Bantu, which means a person is a person through other people. And when you recognize that we're fundamentally connected, when you recognize that we can seek out those connections, it changes the way you look at the world, um, period. And, you know, we need that 
understanding of connection within our country, around the world, et cetera, uh, in so many ways, for so many reasons to tackle so many of the problems, you know, climate change, uh, social justice, the issues that we're confronting right now that someone mentioned earlier today. Um, you know, we need that spirit of Ubuntu to do that. Uh, and that I think sums up what it is that we've been talking about. And I, I appreciate being able to be a part of this conversation and, uh, and love hearing from everybody. So thank you. Great. Well, my thanks to the, the panel. Uh, for those that have not seen the film, I encourage you to uh, uh, find a way to see a towering task. I think you'll find uh, that you get inspired by it. So thank you all very much and have a good evening. Thank you. Pleasure, Tony. Bye, everybody.